Welcome back to the Cross Border Interview Podcast. It is Friday, September 24th, 2021, and we are back with our first uh, political rundown of uh, post federal election, the last political rundown before the Calgary municipal election, Senate elections, referendum elections. And today we are welcoming on a first timer to the show. Uh, Bridget Brown is the founder and writer of Create That Copy and Marketing. Uh, Bridget, thank you so much for doing this. I'm looking forward to digesting all the biggest news stories in politics, but also talking about how small businesses are looking at this new government federally, but also looking at the municipal election coming up. So thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. It's my favorite thing to do is sit around and chat about politics. (laughs) So, uh, Bridget, uh, last time I checked, which was about 20 minutes before we started recording, liberals are still on that path to form that minority government with 158 seats, potentially picking up another one, 159. The Conservatives are at 119, the Bloc Quebecois at 32, the NDP at 25, and the Greens at two. And I should mention that one liberal that was elected will be sitting as an independent, so there will be one independent on day one in this House of Commons. Uh, Bridget, let's let's rip the Band-Aid off. What were your initial oh. thoughts on this election that happened on Monday night? No, first initial thoughts were, that's it. That was what it was all for. I think a lot of people felt like that. And, uh, you know, especially for people who are in small business, I obviously own a small business. My clients are small business owners. I feel like um, the, the sentiment is very much, okay, can we get back to work now, please? Because we ended up in a lot the same position as we were before. And there are a lot of big issues facing the federal government right now, Um, not the least of which is dealing with this pandemic that is worse in Alberta than it is anywhere else. We are uh, all confirmed and uh, all all elected in uh, Alberta. There's a few seats that are still outstanding across the country. But in Alberta, there's 30 conservatives elected, or I should say re-elected, two NDP, which is a pickup of one, and then two liberals, one in Calgary Skyview and one in Edmonton Centre. Uh, The Liberals were shut out in the last election in 2019. Uh, Does this give the credence that Liberals were dead in Alberta some life that, hey, Albertans are actually willing to look at the Liberals moving forward? Or was this just a blip? I don't think it's a blip. I definitely don't. I really feel like there is a movement or some movement in Alberta uh, to send you know, representatives that aren't conservatives to Ottawa. I think what we've seen, uh, though, when we look at like the popular vote, for example, is you see support for the conservatives has dropped by 14%. Um, But I don't know that these additional liberal uh, representatives and NDP representatives are necessarily a result of that. If you look at the races where uh, the liberals won specifically, they were very, very tight races. And, um, you know, a lot of that conservative support was peeled off by the the PPC, which I noticed you did not mention a party you did not mention in the introduction. But I think there was a little bit of a, you know, they were a factor in this election that the conservatives are seeing some of their support peeled off on the right flank. Um, To me, you know, I think it's a great thing. I think uh, George Shahal was a great city councillor. I think he's going to be an excellent MP. I think he's 99% likely to be an excellent cabinet minister the second he walks in the door. I guess we'll have to wait and see on that. Um, you know, it's exciting to see a young person like like the Charlotte uh, get an opportunity to uh, to head to uh, to head to Ottawa as well. Like it's just a really um, exciting thing for these specific representatives. Does it make a big difference in Alberta? Well, I don't know. I think we probably get a cabinet minister now. That'll be nice. <laughs> it will. We'll have set. We'll have an actual voice at the table. Um, you mentioned the PPC. They they grew their support by almost five, uh, five times what they had in the last election. They were close to one million Canadians voting for them. Now, I can talk to 12 different people and they can tell me 12 different things about why the PPC grew. And it wasn't completely all conservatives who went to the PPC. But 
does Maxine Bernier now have, because I'm looking at it, I'll be honest, I'm looking at this and going, okay, Maxine Bernier is now an official party. The first time he was out, okay, it was a fringe group. Second time, okay, you're, you're making some waves. Now with almost a million people getting more of a vote than the Green Party, he is now an official party that we have to watch out for. What is your opinion on what, where this PPC has come from and if they are actually staying around? Because I'm looking at them, I'm, I'm concerned. Well, uh, the, the, my op, the optimist in me hopes that, they're, that it, this is a reaction to people who um, have had too much misinformation coming to them from Facebook. They don't want vaccine mandates and therefore this is the party that's speaking out against them. That's my hope. Um, unfortunately, uh, recently earlier this week, we saw from Maxine Bernier's Twitter account, uh, actually doxing reporters who contacted the party to find out about uh, getting cozy with uh, white nationalists and other problems that they have going on. So to me, uh, while I hope that it's not a lasting movement, um, I don't know that we can completely count them out when they're uh, behaving the way that they are. You know, I don't want to say Maxime Bernier himself docs reporters because who knows who runs that Twitter account, right? But it's, it's the kind of behavior that Canadians typically have not seen in federal politics. And I think the vast majority of us don't want to see. It's what we abhor when we watch uh, US elections. So, you know, and then the other thing is uh, the green collapse well you know a, a big part of that is the inner workings of that party that a lot of us yeah. don't even like most of us don't even know uh so you know i think what we've seen over the years if you use the block quebec law as an example is that support for the block ebbs and flows based on the issues that are going on in quebec society and I think we're going to see that with the PPC as well, is that that issue is going to, their support is going to ebb and flow as the people who really chafe and, and at uh, government intervention decide that that's how they're going to exercise their vote. I would have loved to see Maxime Bernier come out and say, just because these white nationalists are supporting us doesn't mean we're a white nationalist party. We disavow them. But we didn't see that. And the doxing threat yesterday was another good example of, you know, we didn't, he took the opportunity to say the journalists are bad, not the white supremacists are bad. And to me, that's very, very telling. And I hope Canadians who maybe got in there because they have misconceptions about vaccines and about mass mandates actually give some thought to what else this party is tolerating. I, you, you have literally taken the words out of my mouth there, Bridget, because I, I, I am watching this and I'm hoping that it is uh, people who are just uh, misinformed, but at the same time, he has started a movement and has given a voice to people who have never had a voice. And it's going to be interesting to see how the next two to three years plays out with Maxime Bernier and the People's Party of Canada. Is it just a one, one off election where it after quote unquote, the pandemic, which I don't think is going to be ending anytime soon, sort of settles <sighs> down and we can get back to work and people actually get back to their traditional uh, parties or is, is, is what happened in this election with the vitriol and the rhetoric of vaccine passports and ma mandatory vaccinations going to spill over for years to come? And I hope not. I hope, 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 hope not. Well, it, it marks a change in politics in general in Canada. Like as a communicator, as a marketer, what I say to my clients is you want to tell people what you do do, not what you don't do. And I think while there's certainly some of that, I think in politics, um, that's how our, our parties have typically run. They, they say, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. And we don't like the other guys because they do this, this, and this. But what is going to have to happen if these parties want to remain responsible and truly fight misinformation is they're going to have to say, I don't stand behind people who act like this, 
I don't believe it's uh, good for democracy to have this happening. They need to take more of a stand on some of these issues. And I, I, I think if the CPC ever hopes to regain the kind of support it saw, you know, say 2006 to 2010, that kind of era, they're going to have to do that because what's happening now is they're not disavowing those anti-vaxxers, those um, anti-maskers loudly enough to make the left side of their party, the more center left folks, comfortable. And so if they want to make any kind of rebound, they're going to have to do that. Same goes if the liberals are going to hope to have a majority government, they're going to have to be a little bit more explicit about what they stand for. Because right now you have a lot of leaders that are trying to be nice and vague so as not to piss off anybody that whose votes they could potentially harvest, right? Yeah. Um, I, you mentioned the conservatives. Uh, Andrew Shearer was a one, ter one, one election leader. There are already knives out for Aaron O'Toole for taking the Conservative Party yeah. too far to the center left, center uh, center of the uh, the political spectrum. Um, I, I I've looked at the numbers across Alberta. The vote in Alberta is down. People stayed home. I think uh, traditionally where you would see a Michelle Rempel Gardner about 60% of the vote is barely scraping by at 52, 53% of the vote this election. Does Aaron O'Toole need to bring the party back to the right of this political spectrum or need to resign or need to try and continue on this battle of dragging the party as much as they don't want to with uh, carbon tax, price mm -hmm. on carbon, whatever you want to call it, to the political center, even if the party doesn't want to go that way? Well, they have two choices. And it's the it's a very, uh, you know, clear example of pick a lane. I, I don't know what I would, I don't envy their strategists, because if they come away from that election thinking they didn't go far enough right, um, you know, I think that's distressing. I think that that sends a signal that they're hoping to scoop in all of those PPC voters that they lost. And as far as a winning strategy, I mean, I suppose that I think it's terrible for Canada, but I mean, I, I suppose it could work. The problem is, um, you know, there's an entire group of moderates. And I think when you, what you touched on when you noted that how few uh, Albertans went out to vote that are kind of stuck because they don't like the Liberal Party for whatever reason, be it the leader, be it their typical attitude toward the West, it's the, be it pipelines, like whatever it is, they don't like the Liberal Party, um, but they're also not cuckoo bananas. So they don't wanna vote for uh, an individual who is uh, you know, being anything other than very supportive of LGBTQ plus rights, who is being very supportive of making sure that a woman's right to choose stays uh, the way that it is, and who is very supportive of, uh, you know, the common sense means of dealing with a global pandemic, um, who I think most Albertans uh, are very accepting of refugees. I think most Albertans are very accepting of a lot of these sort of centrist uh, to left, centrist to progressive kind of viewpoints. So if they take that swing and do try, the conservatives, and do try to pick up those PC voters, I don't know that they will alienate fewer people. It seems like low hanging fruit, um, but you know, I think they end up shooting themselves in the foot for the long run. And I think we really saw Stephen Harper um, when he was leader, really try to shut down that part of the party so that uh, people who consider themselves centrists or moderates could feel comfortable. And I, I hesitate to think what happens if they don't come back to that. Now, uh, for, the, for my listeners, uh, you, you uh, Bridget, are a former reporter. You worked at CTV. I'm assuming I'm allowed to say that. Hopefully, if, if I'm not, I will cut that no. out. But <laughs> you, you are a former journalist. You, you have probably covered your fair share of elections like I have in my heyday of being a journalist as well. Um, we, we, we have seen the rise of, and I, I don't want to, I want to use this word correctly because i want to get your opinion as a former journalist on this we have seen the rise of fringe media outlets and I, I i use the word media outlets very loosely on this one but media outlets does it make it harder to cover politics in today's age 
when you have organizations and I'm, I, I, I hate to plug them, but like Rebel News who come out and spew the hard right narrative that is not going on in this world. But that is the problem. Don't get me wrong. I think Rebel News is a scourge. I think Post Millennial is not something that I prefer to read. Um, you know, there's a lot of problems with those organizations. But that isn't, they're more of a canary in the coal mine. I think a bigger problem is the fact that every newspaper, every major newspaper, except for maybe two or three in Canada, is owned by hedge fund owned post media, American hedge fund owned post media. And you see that in the columnists they choose to hire, in what their editorial board recommends for, for who to choose. Obviously, they went with the conservatives. Uh, again, I think that there could be room for these fringe. Uh, like, for example, I'm on the other fringe. I love reading the Daily Beast. I love reading One Cat, which are, you know, left fringe outlets. But I'm not pretending that that's a regular news outlet. It's yeah. a bunch of people who think the same as me saying the things I think. That's fun to read. There's nothing wrong with that. You could say the same for The Rebel. You could say the same for Post Millennial. You could say the same for Quillette. Some of these other media outlets that are very far right. It's when we don't have proper journalism happening in the middle that those media outlets start to be a problem because there isn't a source then that can be truly considered unbiased. And I think the other problem is, of course, uh, I have a big hate on for Facebook, which sounds funny coming from a marketer because, of course, um, many of my clients use social media. I my team does that for them. But I think social media allows you to just insulate yourself with the views that you already hold. And so when you share that, um, what happens is the people who are in your feed see these quote unquote facts coming from you and they're more likely to believe them than if they just encounter them in the wild. And it's, a, it's an enormous problem that's not being addressed. I agree wholeheartedly. Social media has, as much as it's a double-edged sword, as I call it, as much as it's been the downfall of our society for people being able to spew whatever they want on there, it does give the benefit. Uh, uh, there is a benefit to it for small business owners and small businesses across this country and around the world to market themselves to people who might not have seen them beforehand. So I, I, yeah. social, social media has never been a big fan. I've never been a big fan. <laughs> Well, you know, the other thing is we don't know very much about what that fire hose of information right into the brain even does. You know, there's been so much research into advertising that advertisers can be um, inc more strategic than any of us ever could ever guess. But what we don't know is, um, you know, the new wave of what you might call advertising being what the algorithms of social media are showing you. We don't know that much about it. And the stuff that's coming out isn't very promising. You know, there's a new study out either this week or last week talking about how social media is linked to increase in teen suicides, about how young women are seeing Instagram uh, posts and they're genuinely affecting their self-esteem. So it's not just in politics, although that might be the most worrying for some people. It's that we just don't know a lot about what the dopamine hits we get from social media are doing to us in the big picture. I know that's a bit off topic, but I think it's pretty meaningful meaningful in both the city election and in the federal election, because that's where a lot of people are going to make decisions about things these days. Oh, I agree wholeheartedly. And that's the great thing about the show. We start with one topic and we, we talk, we have an honest discussion and wherever it leads us, it leads us to where that is. I want, I want to get back to the federal election though, because as a business owner yourself, as a business owner myself, uh, I'm assuming you looked through all the platforms like I did to see where the parties stood on business, small businesses and how they would help if elected. Uh, uh, I, I got to ask the question, did you see anything in any of the platforms that you would have liked to have seen or will would like to see implement it? If it was a conservative idea, if the liberals take it, you'd be happy with that. If it was an NDP idea, you'd be happy if the conserv uh, the liberals took it and uh, implemented it as well. Was there anything in this election that spoke to you as a small business owner, as a business owner, but also that you have put towards your clients and said, hey, 
this is what's coming down because the liberals have this in their uh, platform because of the uh now that they're back in office this is what you might see as a small business owner from them well i did take a careful look i want it like full disclosure i voted liberal um i am not an enormous justin trudeau fan um by any stretch but in my particular writing i enjoyed the candidate the candidate did not win um but i i that that was the choice that i made and i think i was in a situation with a lot of people where uh what you want the government to do in terms of the pandemic and in terms of some of the other um taking care of people aspects of government um ultimately outweighed everything. Um, but what I will say is, I don't think they went far enough in their supports for small business. Um, and so what I'm happy about is that they ended up in this minority position. I think that there's a lot of pressure from the NDP and the Green to extend wage and rent subsidies, which are huge for small businesses. Um, things that the Liberals were very clearly, uh, if not in word, but indeed, uh, trying to wind down or move away from spending money on. Uh, and I think that they're going to be hard pressed to cut back in, on those kinds of supports. But the interesting thing about this election and another reason why I chose to vote liberal is because I really hope that that ten dollar child a day child care will come to fruition. Now, it doesn't necessarily affect me directly, but it does make life easier for small business owners. It's just another thing that will help with the labor shortage that we have going on right now, which is I think one of the largest issues facing small business owners. And it just points to the fact that a lot of the policies that affect small business owners the most aren't necessarily the specific, you know, tax incentives or grant programs or something that get promised during an election. It's the big platform planks that end up having this spin off on small business. Um, you know, the the um, CPC's promises for small business were very much going to help businesses that were already successful. Like they were looking at loans as opposed to grants. They were looking at tax incentives, which, you know, only help you if you're bringing in revenue. Um, and there was incentives to hire more people, which isn't what a lot of like my clients, for example, it's not what they need. So I think um, things like housing policy, things like um, helping businesses make the transition to online from bricks and mortar. And then of course, those vaccine passport programs uh, are really what is going to make the difference in helping small businesses survive and thrive through the end of the pandemic. I you have I feel like we're kindred <laughs> spirits on this issue because I looked at all the platforms as well as a small business owner myself I I looked at it I tried to keep an open mind and I got into a fight with a conservative supporter not a fight but a disagreement with a conservative supporter that the conservative platform would do more for me than the liberals and I, I looked at both of them and I said I, I I don't know where you're thinking that I am a multi-millionaire who's going to be making a shitload of money this year but I'm not I'm getting by and that's the way that the world works so I, I, I agree that loans are great for multi-million companies that are already successful, but for the struggling mom and pa businesses, the small, small businesses, the one-person businesses, it, it doesn't help us, right? So I, well, I, I that's exactly it. Like, you know, you have a situation where they talk about SMEs being small, medium enterprises, and most of the parties are lumping them in as one, but you can't deny that the solopreneur service of provider, which is how I ran my business for the first few years I was in business before I hired anyone, um, you know, they have totally different needs than a medium sized enterprise that has annual revenue of, you know, $25 million and has 50 employees, like how can you even put those two groups in the same strategy, really? I, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You heard it here well, first. Stop doing that, politicians. And I really love the idea of um, offering money to bricks and mortar businesses who need to transition online because that is something that many businesses managed to do successfully. A lot of my clients were scrambling to do and ultimately we, we made it happen during the pandemic. But I don't think that the need for that is going to change just because um, you know people are healthy again and we don't have to worry as much about the coronavirus. I think that uh, people have become used to getting their needs met online whenever they want. And so the Liberals plan to have to 
provide some kind of money, we don't know a lot of details yet, but to provide some kind of money for that transition online, I think is just good for the economy in general. Well, I, I want to I wanna talk about that for a second, because it's been something that's been in the back of my head for a while now, and that is that transition, because this pandemic has shown that people don't need to leave their house to do anything anymore. You have <laughs> companies that will deliver groceries to you. You have companies that will deliver clothing to you from Amazon through anything. You, you literally do not need to leave your house unless you like desperately need to go to the hospital or small issues. It, it, small businesses are needing to make that transition into a more web-based delivering of services, delivering of uh, goods. How does this affect small businesses here in Calgary and your client base? Because I'm I, I'm having that issue as well, because traditionally I would be leaving once a month to go to uh, work with my clients, but now it's all through Zoom, it's all through virtual. And when I renegotiate contracts, they are now saying we don't need to pay you traveling expenses because we don't need that anymore. So it, it's a hit for a loss for me because I'm no longer making that extra money that was covering some bills. So how do you talk to your business owners and say, hey, you have to, it's going to hurt for a while, but it's the new norm that we are in. Well, and, and that's really what it, what it comes down to is sometimes um, a necessary transition uh, comes as a result of something that you don't want to do. But, you know, I think that it makes a lot of sense in Canada where we're so dependent on weather, where we're such a large country that people are divided by uh, several time zones, people that are dealing with each other every day. Um, but I think that one of the most important things to do is kind of look toward the future and determine, you know, is there an interruption in your current sales channels? So if you sell in person, um, what could interrupt that? And I'm sure most people already know from the pandemic, but also, um, you know, what is going to make it possible for you to maintain or grow revenues while also sort of taking whatever slings and arrows the, the surrounding environment can provide to you. And so I don't know that it's a new thing. I just think that for the first time, all businesses at once had to deal with it. But really, all small businesses should be taking a look at these uh, societal changes that could take place that could have a major difference in how they deliver and if you don't believe me ask a travel agent <laughs> because there are some very very uh successful travel agents still but they're not selling cruises to my parents you know what I mean like they had to find a way to take their business and what they do and either learn to offer more so um you know you see that a lot in the people who have fully planned vacations that um, every single thing that they do on their vacation is concierge for them by a travel agent or um, moving, moving into the business space so that they are, um, you know, booking, booking, working within a large corporation and booking that corporation's travel. Um, you know, that's just one example of a company that's had to, um, you know, do a lot of different uh, ways of doing business so that they could maintain their, their previous revenue and not everyone survived. And so I think that the companies that will survive will be the ones that can demonstrate that they can read what their audience wants and provide that to them. And that's no different than it was before. Unfortunately, it's moving faster right now, but really all of us have always had to look at what our clients are going to want and to shape our businesses and change and modify and grow based on that as it changes. Now, small businesses are not just looking at the federal government for support. They're looking at all the other elections that are happening right now as well. Yes. And the other, the other one is literally happening as we speak. It is still ongoing. It is the municipal elections here across Alberta. And particularly, I want to focus here on in Calgary. Um, we are 20 some odd days from election day, October 18th. Uh, have let's start with the mayoral candidates first. Have you heard anything from the mayoral candidates around small businesses and how they envision helping small businesses th thrive during this fourth, I don't want to say fifth, but potentially fifth wave after everything's said and done? 
have to say, I, sh I should say for full disclosure that I was um, working on, or my company was working on a uh, Kent Harris campaign uh, before he had to pull out uh, due to illness. And so um, I think it's important that I, I disclose that. Um, but one of the things that I was very proud of, of uh, working on that campaign is the kinds of help that uh, were being promised for small businesses. And it's similar to the federal election where sometimes just good policy is good policy and it rolls down to small business. So in Kent's case, he had a, a very comprehensive plan to offer free transit. And that has an amazing spinoff for small businesses, uh, you know, and offers uh, not only place ways for their clients to get to them, but ways for people to get around, uh, ways to, uh, you know, go through the city to places that you wouldn't normally go. Those kinds of spinoffs would have been excellent. Um, there was a progressive property tax plan where uh, people People with property that was worth more money would pay tax at a higher rate. And so these are just some really new ideas that um, are not obviously going to come to fruition now, which is disappointing. What I saw from, and I really only care about kind of the main candidates, what I saw from the, the Gondek and the Farkas camp is a lot of the same platitudes that we've been seeing, that they recognize that the tax burden on small business owners is too high. Well, duh. You know what I mean? Like we knew this. And I think that what I would like to see is a little bit more comprehensive detail on new fresh ideas that don't involve cutting services that will maintain, um, you know, the, the small businesses ability to, to, to fund themselves. And I don't see that from either of those two main camps, at least that's what the um, Think HQ poll that came out earlier this week said, that it's it's basically that that two horse race for right now. So I would like to see a little bit more of that. I think um, housing policy and land development policy is definitely related to that too. The more out we build, the, the more difficult it is for centrally located businesses to operate, um, you know, that kind of thing. So I, I saw that poll that just came out as well, the two horse race of uh, Farkas and Gondek. But the one thing that I was shocked at, we are less than 20 days away from uh, E-Day. We are less than a week and a bit from advanced poll polls opening is the amount of undecided. 28% of people in that survey, I think uh, I think it was think HQ, I'm not, I, I apologize, I don't remember exactly which one it was, um, said that they are still undecided in this election. That's a lot. That's a lot to me. You know, and I have to... to I, oh, so I'm just going to say this one last you thing. You go, you I'll, go. I've been talking to my neighbors. The apathy in this election, this municipal election, has got me concerned that we are engaging with the partisans, but not with the people who are actually going to have to make the decision at the end of the day. There's still a large portion of this uh, city that does not know where they're putting their vote or even if they are going to vote on election day in advance voting. First question off the bat is, are you, because you were working with the Kent Hare campaign, I've got to ask, mm -hmm. Were you seeing apathy at the doors? Were you, were you, have you been hearing about apathy across the city? And if so, how do we engage those people to actually get, and I apologize to my listeners, but get off their ass and actually get it and vote? You know, I think part of the problem with this apathy is that the three front runners are part of a very dysfunctional, disappointing city council. And so, it doesn't matter what side of the political spectrum you are on, chances are, and there was a leger poll in the summer that supports this, you weren't happy with the city council. So it's no wonder for me that, you know, 28% or something of people are still undecided. If you didn't like the last council, you don't like any of your choices <laughs> uh, that are front running. You know, and I'm in that undecided group now, now that Kent's out. But one of the things that I would say is, you know, that campaign was really hoping to scoop up that 28%. That was the whole, you know, strategy. That was the whole plan was to scoop up that 20%. And I think that uh, he could have made a very big dent there. Um, hadn't even released any uh, platform pieces and was already pulling uh, higher than, you know, Bradfield and, and in and around Jan Damry, and he hadn't even released his platform yet. So I think there would have been an opportunity there. So it, it's disappointing. But what I would say is, you know, 
people are frustrated. They don't like how things have been dealt with either because they want vaccine passports or they hate vaccine passports because they want sprawl to be able to go ahead because they hate sprawl. They want the flames to get through arena because they hate that idea. And so it doesn't really matter what which of those perspectives you hold, none of the people that are running are going to make any enormous differences um, from, from the last council. What are you looking for in the last 20 days of this election, 20 some odd days in this election? Because uh, signs don't vote. No. I will be the first to admit that. You can throw a million signs up on 16th Avenue, which where I'm near, and it still doesn't mean that people are going to get out and vote for you. So what are you looking for from the candidates? Because you and I are in the same boat. I'm undecided still. I am so undecided that it is so confusing to know because there's 28 can 27 candidates running in this mayoral race. We're not even talking about the Ward 10 riding yet because and that's where I live and they have the most candidates running in Ward 10. So I don't know where my vote's going because there's it it is so saturated with so many ideas that at the end of the day, I, I'm just is it just throwing darts at the wall? Like, what are you looking for as an undecided voter when you're going out to vote? So it's hard for me because part of my undecided decided voter hat is also what I would do if I was working on those campaigns hat. And yeah. so I think, um, you know, first of all, my question is going to be, is somebody going to drop out and where that person's going to throw their support? Kent chose not to endorse anybody. Um, and I'm wondering, like, polling at 6%, he's got a lot of money behind him, uh, though, does that mean Jeff Davison is, is going to pull out before the election? There's no signs of that. But you got to wonder, Bradfield has been running for like a year and hasn't been able to move the needle. you got to wonder if he's going to drop out, right? Um, I think that for me, what I'm looking for as a voter um, is a little bit more inspiration. Where are the bold ideas? Where are the big um, creative ways? There are a lot of cities in North America that are doing some really, really exciting things to try to recoup more revenue, to try to offer tax relief, to try to maintain services. Um, and free transit is just one of them. You know, there's things that need to be done to change the policing model. I think uh, the last council got too hung up on the terminology defund the police when most Calgarians agree that what they want is uh, better mental health supports for people who, who need it and, and maybe unarmed mental health support for people who need it and, and other changes to policing that, that um, could, could help our city. So I think that there's, uh, I, what I'm looking for is some creative ideas to address this. And I have seen the most creative ideas come out of Jan Damery's camp. But again, she doesn't really seem to be um, breaking that 5% mark. So I don't know, you know, and maybe they need to start saying what they don't like. Back to my earlier thing about the parties earlier, I, I never want somebody to get, you know, full, full bore on attack ads, but maybe they need to start talking about, you know, if I'm your mayor, I won't do this, that mm -hmm. kind of thing. I, 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 so, someone, I agree that someone needs to break out of this pack. Someone needs to break out and just throw this election on its head but no one's willing to do what you just said everyone's willing to say what they're willing to do i want one candidate just you know what not, don't throw in the towel but just come out in front of a microphone stand in front of the uh cameras and say here's what i'm not going to do here's how i'm not going to screw up this city i'm every candidate right now is saying what they're going to do how it's going to be great but let's talk about the things you won't do. Just, just no. tell me. Be honest and with me. Be like, honest. And that's the thing. We are not seeing a lot of authenticity right now. Because you have a candidate like Jody Gondek. She is so accomplished. She has offered a lot to city council. But she is funded by big real estate developers. And the fact that she's trying to shy away from that and hide that and obscure that makes no sense to me because it's already come to play. She voted to finish those 14 communities, those 14 suburban sprawl communities, and 14 developers behind those communities donated to her her election this time around. So why not just own that? There are people in the city that are comfortable with how she voted. Just be honest. 
don't get out there and pretend to be super progressive when you're voting to um, loan the stampede money during a pandemic. So, and this is the thing that I have a hard time getting on board with with some of these candidates. I think the one that's done the best job of that has been Brad Field, who's like, look, I don't have any political experience. I'm a business guy, but I think there could be some benefit to running the city like a business. I mean, at least that's an honest perspective and it gives the electorate a chance to view that and go yes or no. And to me, you know, she's painting herself into a real corner because if she is going to continue to be, um, you know, I, I don't know, I would say anti-union, but not particularly uh, pro supporting city union workers and sort of other non-progressive issues, um, you know, her, her supporters are going to be real surprised uh, if she wins the mayoral race. Uh, Ken, I'm a white male. I, I, for those who for those who have not I was watched the well, show, I I can see you right now, so I know this. Okay, but I'm I have to I have to preface this because this is going to sound very derogatory, and I don't mean it this way. There is a rise in this city of people attacking other people. And I'm not going to say names. I'm not going to throw out names because that's not what I do. But there's there's a rise of people who are in the camp of we need to vote for a woman. We need to vote for a woman because we've never had a woman mayor. I'm going to ask you this question as the woman on the show right now. What do you say about what do you say about that that type of thinking and that type of politics? I, 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 at the end of the day, I, I think to myself, I want to vote for the person that has the best policies. I, 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 don't, I don't look at the candidate. I look at the policies. If you have a good policy, I will vote for you. If you don't, I'm not voting for you. I, 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 the, the identity politics that we are getting into in this election has got me so angry that I just want to walk away and say, okay, I'm not even going to vote because I just pissed off at how, okay, this person's LGBT, this person's a woman, this person's this, this, that, and the other. And just going, I, I don't care. I want to know what policy you have. What is your opinion on this as the woman on the show right now? Well, I'm the woman on the show and I'm also uh, a, a very loud feminist. Um, <laughs> and to me, voting for somebody just because they're a woman is insulting. If her policies are the best policies, then she will win. She doesn't need people joining her camp because of her identity. And so to me, I that's how I view it. I don't want um, clients to hire me because I'm a woman. I want clients to hire me because I can generate more leads for their business and um, increase their sales. And I would be insulted if somebody was like, well, I just wanted to add a woman to my team. So you're it. So that's the, that's where I'm coming at this from. But the other thing is you mentioned, um, you know, there are a lot of, uh, of groups and that, you know, could use better representation. Um, you mentioned LGBT, Jeremy Farkas would be Calgary's first LGBT mayor. Kent Hare would have been Calgary's first mayor who uses a wheelchair. Jody Gondek would be Calgary's first woman mayor and Calgary's first woman of color mayor, Calgary's first Indo-Canadian mayor. All of those things are exciting milestones, but those are exactly that. They're milestones to be achieved. They aren't reasons to select someone. I'm clapping because oh, I agree. that's nice. <laughs> I agree. I am sorry, but give me good policy and I'll vote for you. Tell me that I should vote for you because of a certain reason. Not gonna happen. So I think there's a lot I think of a lot of I think a lot of women are saying right now, um, you know, I don't, I don't want to vote for Jeremy Farkas because I've seen his, his Twitter exchanges with Jason Kenney, and they're obviously peas in a pod. Um, so at least Jody Gondek's a woman, you know, and I just think, really, that's the best we can do is like, you don't like anybody, but at least she's a woman. That's just sad. That's just unfortunate. But but at the same case, Jan Damry, last time I checked, was a woman. Grace Yan is last time I checked a woman. Like there's exactly. Other women <laughs> and you know, and you know, there are it, hopefully it gets to a point where um that isn't, you know, a, a deciding factor. Like it would be really great. We have a transgender candidate running for city council. We have at least one that I know of running for city council. All of these things are wonderful, 
but they aren't the reasons those people are qualified. And I think that that's just an important distinction for people to make. I would love to see a woman mayor in Calgary. I would love to see a non-binary or transgender representative at City Hall. All of those things would make me so pleased and so excited because in a way it does indicate progress in our society, but I can't vote for somebody because of that. I could not agree more. Um, I'm just looking at time here. We are about 45 minutes into this. This is how this, this is how time. This is how it's great. It's that time has gone great here, and uh, we've covered a lot of topics. But I, I do want to. Uh, I want to focus a little bit more on the mayoral uh, on the Calgary municipal election here because while it's great that we can all talk about the minis, uh, the mayor, the mayor is one vote. We are a weak mayoral system here in the city of Calgary. He has what he or she has one vote at the end of the day, and he needs or she needs seven other people to vote with them to get anything passed. Are you looking at the crop of candidates uh, in each ward, and not just one ward, but each ward, and looking for people that could potentially help move the city forward, or are you more focused on the mayoral race? Because I. I I'm more focused on the ward races because I think that we always forget those and we sometimes elect people who may not want to be, who should, who may, we may elect people who should not be there. So I'm focused on the ward races. What about yourself? Are you looking at them or are you more focused on that mayoral race? Well, here's the thing. Calgary is at a crossroads right now economically. And so while when deciding specific city hall issues, yes, the mayor only has one vote. We need a mayor who is comfortable, welcomed on the world stage so that they can get out there and basically shill for Calgary, right? Like it's a big part of the job. It's the mayor who gets invited to uh, conferences all over the world and and who is recognized outside Calgary and that is what will help draw investment and if we don't manage to draw investment and young people to this city it's going to be a problem so there's that on the other hand the day in and day out of what council does is like 99% land use okay that's an exaggeration but it's a lot of land use um, and it's a lot of little issues that the councillors um, will be just as much of a deciding point as the mayor. And so all of us, I think, need to um, make sure that we're thinking with kind of both caps on, if that makes sense. And I think one thing that doesn't often get brought up in races, and it was another reason I supported Kent, is because you need a council that can collaborate I think the, the last council was exceptionally dysfunctional. I called, covered municipal politics since 2002, and it is the most dysfunctional council I've ever seen. We need a council that will at least work together. Do you mind me asking which ward do you live in? Oh, yeah, no, no, no. I, I live in uh, Sean Chu's ward right now. Ward where, um, yeah. For those who are listening, I just want to let you know that last night we had a debate with Ward 4 candidates Angela McIntyre and DJ Kelly. Uh, you can go to YouTube and watch that if you want. There's my shameless plug for the episode. <laughs> we'll do that. DJ Kelly came to my door and was very, very impressive. I'm interested in, uh, in learning more about that. Well, watch the debate tonight at seven o'clock. Well, on Thursday night, for those who are listening right now, because this comes out tomorrow morning on a Friday. Um, Last question for you before we do our wrap up. Um, I, I, I love giving people the opportunity to plug their information, plug who you are, because at the end of the day, I, I, wanna, I wanna make this show a place where people can come on and talk about things, but also to promote themselves because we need to get that out there. We need to get information businesses out there. So um, Bridget. How can people follow you? How can people uh, get in contact with you? How can people learn more about create that copy and marketing? Well, I would say I help small businesses of under 50 employees increase the leads they bring in by 50%. And so if that's something that your listeners are looking for, they can find me at createthatcopy.com. And I do a free marketing tip every Sunday that small businesses can implement to make the marketing lift a little bit easier. So thank you so much. Createthatcopy.com is where people go to get that info. 
And as always, to my listeners and to my viewers, uh, you you know the rules, the show notes. Go check out the website. It's there. Uh, the link is there. So I would highly recommend that you do that. And uh, that free uh, Sunday actionable item. Yeah. That to help you market. Help you market. I would highly check that out as well. I am going to start checking that out every Sunday as well. Um, hey. So without further ado, um, Bridget, this has been an honor and a pleasure. I love talking politics with anyone and everyone, and especially when I can uh, get someone on the show for the first time and start a re reputation of talking small businesses, talking politics with someone is my is my Super Bowl. So thank you so much for doing this uh, on short notice, but also I hope we can do this again. Me too. I had so much fun. Thank you so much, Chris.